Today's guest on a Life and a Living podcast is Joey Coleman. Now, Joey is the author of the book, Never Lose a Customer Again. Uh, the strap line is turn any sale into lifelong loyalty in 100 days. And this is your customers. If you're looking for customers, if you're looking to retain customers, this is a fantastic book. I'd highly recommend it. It's not only a really good read, but it's also an excellent playbook because it gives all sorts of questions and challenges at the end of each section and really kind of spurs you on to create action points to do that. But we talk uh, all about customers and all about customer loyalty and retention. We talk about the importance and the, the, the impact on bottom line of retaining your customers and the impact of actually selling to existing customers. But he also talks a lot about the where the, the drop-off happens between the, the, the pre-purchase, the purchase, and the post-purchase, and where so often we drop the baton there and we lose customers, and how in that 100 days that customers, and he's got loads of statistics to actually, you know, to, to underline this, where customers actually would decide not to stay with you and not to buy from you again. So that 100 days, and he has got a really good system and process for making sure that you actually do really, really secure that customer and deliver excellence to that. So he's absolutely passionate about customer loyalty and he really does make us all think deeply about how we are managing that customer interaction from beginning to end and not having just as organizations do break it up into different parts of the organization and they only see that particular piece of the customer interaction and they don't see it from end to end. So really it is a fantastic interview. Joey was terribly generous with his time. I did keep him for longer than I said I was going to uh, but he was so generous with his time. And if you want to uh, listen to other really good interviews with some great great people like Joey, then go to my website, www.johnmurphyinternational.com. If you want to reach out to me, you can get me at john at johnmurphyinternational.com. But in the meantime, sit back and enjoy this really, really excellent interview about customers, how to find them, how to hold on to them, and how to make them really, really profitable. Joey, thank you so much indeed for joining us on a Life and a Living podcast. It's a great treat to have you here. Oh, John, it's my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks to everybody who's listening and tuning in. Well, listen, I see you've got one or two books behind you that have got I do, I do but I also we, have we, your one here. So. We, seem to, we seem to share a, a common uh, <laughs> uh, collectorship of the same Absolutely. book. I love it. Well, I loved your book, which is why I really thank wanted you. to get you on the podcast. But not only is it a really good read, but it's also what I call a playbook. It's just that really there are great exercises to do at the end of every section that are really practical, really pragmatic. So congratulations on that. It's really sparked me to take a few actions on things that I thought, gosh, you know what? I'm not doing any of that. So I thank you for that. I love, well, it is my pleasure. Thank you. I, I'm, uh, it, it is encouraging as an author when you write a book with the goal of having people actually use the book uh, <laughs> to hear that people are doing that. See, I think that there, John, that there are three types of speakers and writers. There are those who want you to think differently, those who want you to feel differently, and those who want you to act differently. Yeah. And while I certainly want my readers and the people who listen to the speeches I give to you know, think and feel differently, if they don't act differently, I don't feel like I've earned my keep. Uh, that, and so it's a real pleasure to hear you say that it's led to some action in your business as well. Well, I think that, you know, I think it's a really important point that you make because, I mean, you can, you can read and you can take it in, you can reflect upon it, but if you don't do anything with it, it's not really an awful lot of use to you. Right. And, and, you know, I would posit there are certainly some books that just if they make you think differently yeah. or just if they make you feel differently, they've still had valuable impact. But as a business book writer, yeah. I think it's getting you to take that action is yeah. the next step. A couple of things that, are, that are, I, I, I just want to talk to you about, because, you know, we talk about and we hear an awful lot about kind of B2B and B2C. Sure. And it's not your, they're not your favorite terms. You're more they're about not. H2H. So you have to elaborate on that. Yes. Yeah, so I, I think a lot of businesses, especially in the last 20 years, maybe 30 years, have gotten very fixated on, well, we're B2B, so we're different, or we're B2C, so it's different. And I think these acronyms and these uh, silos that we put ourselves into as business 
miss the key point. And the key point being is that we're all H to H or H to H as people would say, right? The, this idea of human to human. At the end of the day, whether you are a uh, working in a B2B or a B2C business, it doesn't matter because you're a human selling or serving another human. And I think when we focus on the humanity piece of the connection, it allows us to think more holistically about the experience we're trying to create and to have more connection with the people we're trying to serve. And do you think that when, you know, you know, organizations who would refer to themselves as B2B, do you think they kind of fall into that trap of a little bit of corporate speak that isn't really real language? I, I do. I think they not only fall into corporate speak, but they often uh, are more comfortable defaulting to, well, it's all about price or it's all about delivery. They, they, they fail to connect with the human nature of the interactions they have with their clients. You know, at the end of the day, the person who is signing the contract or buying your product or service or using your product or service is a human being as well. And while they may be doing an analysis, a business analysis of the value that you provide or the features that you offer, they are also doing an emotional analysis of what it's like to do business with you. Now, they may not be uh, as comfortable talking about that emotional analysis or they may not be as keen as leaning into that conversation with you. But the reality is that's who they're comparing you to. See, lots of times in a B2B setting, we think, oh, well, they're evaluating our software compared to the four other software companies in our industry. No, the person they're evaluating you against is Amazon and Netflix and Tesla and Disney and all the amazing experiences that they've had from these brands as a consumer that they don't leave that part of their brain or that part of their heart when they go into the office. It's still there. And that's who the competition really is. So I think whenever I work with some of my consulting clients or speaking clients and we talk about, well, who are you benchmarking against? I want them to benchmark against the best experience that your customer has ever had. Not the best experience they've had in your vertical within your product suite. Yeah, because it's interesting. I mean, you because you've worked with a lot of big brands that you would in many ways, I mean, the likes of Volkswagen and the likes, you know, of Zappos and Whirlpool, you know, that you would not, you know, that, 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 that are, would see themselves probably in some ways it would be described as B2B in some ways because they in probably, some ways, sure. because they probably actually sell to businesses who may yes. sell on to the, the public. But if you think of the, as you, you say, the, the Amazon, that really does capture it because that's how they, how they, how they really get. But it just, Going on from that, one of the things that you, you mention in the book and you talk about the, the customer life cycle and you talk about the kind of the pre-purchase, the purchase and the post-purchase, and you believe that the transition from one to the other tends not to be great. Yes. What I, do you th I, I, why do you think that is? And, because, and, and I would agree with you because I think yeah. that does happen. I mean, the classic for me always when I was on the other side in the corporate world is that you had PR agencies or advertising agencies come to pitch you to you, right? So you got yep. the owners and the directors and the, 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 the top <laughs> people, right? And then when right. they got the contract, they sent Junior in. Correct. Right. Correct. Yeah. I, I think that there, there's a number of reasons that contribute to this. I often think of it as the handoff. And if you have the chance to ever watch a, a track and field event at the Olympics or the Pan Am Games or something like this, when the baton, when you're going to hand the baton to the other runner in the relay race and the baton drops and hits the track, you don't get the chance to pick up the baton and keep running with it. Mm. You're disqualified. That's the end of the race. And I think the same holds true in business. When on the handoff between one department and another, we drop the customer. Sure, we can try to get them back, but we are in big trouble. It is very, very difficult. And I think the reason most businesses struggle with these handoffs is because the handoffs are happening between departments and between individuals. And the customer isn't aware that the handoff is coming. What I mean by that is if you go to the pitch meeting and you had the director, to use your example, and the head of the company, but they also brought one of the junior account managers and they said, if you decide to work with us, John, you're going to get to work with Sarah and Bobby as well. Yeah. That act alone 
would build confidence in you that, oh, you're getting the whole team. They're all going to be involved, but I've met these people. What normally happens is you sign on the dotted line, you hand over your hard-earned cash, and then they say, Oh, great. Thank you so much for becoming a customer. Now we'd like to introduce you to someone that you've never met, you've never right. even heard about, and they're responsible for maintaining this relationship going forward. It's just a recipe for failure. Yeah. And I mean, the title of your book is Never Losing a Customer Again, which is all about retention. And one of the stats that you, you quote in the book is that you know, the 5% improvement in customer retention yields a massive 20, 25 to up to 100% increase in profits. I mean, that is... That is extraordinary. And is it that we are so fixated about new business and new clients? Is that, what, is that the cause of that and we don't pay attention to the, the retention side? Well, I think there's a number of things. Yeah, I mean, the short answer, John, is yes. But I think there's a number of factors that contribute to this behavior. Number one, the human condition is one of chasing, not one of tending. And we need to only look to people's dating lives to see that as a general rule, people are better in the chase than they are in the catch, right? It's globally a challenge. Um, it's also the case that most businesses are set up that the person who's responsible for retention, who's responsible for the customer experience, in most businesses reports up to the head of marketing, who then the head of marketing reports up to the CEO. Now let's pretend you go into a meeting with the CEO and you're the head of marketing. Do you think you're gonna talk about marketing or customer experience? Well, given that your title is head of marketing, I think you're probably gonna talk more about marketing. So we're already set up structurally, not to mention that depending on which statistics and where you are in the world, somewhere between 40 and 70% of CEOs come from a marketing or acquisition or sales background as opposed to an account management retention operations background. So what it means is everyone in the chain is predisposed to caring more about the new, the sparkly, the fresh, the, you know, the acquired business as opposed to the retained business. Mm. But as you allude to, that's where all the profit lies. The profit doesn't lie in the newly acquired customer because we still have to recoup the marketing and sales expenses. We have to get them onboarded. The dollars they're spending with us in the beginning are not nearly as profitable because we're covering a lot of setup and getting things up and running. The much more profitable customers are the ones who've been with us for a long time because we've already recouped the marketing expenses and the sales expenses. We've got them set up in our systems. We know how to deal with them. The conversations are faster. They're more effective. They're more efficient. And each incremental dollar they spend with us is more profitable, which is why the statistic you quote, which comes from Harvard Business School, Stanford Business School, mm. Bain and Company, Frederick Reichheld, the gentleman who came up with net promoter score that most businesses today are familiar you're with, all of that research proves that saving 5% of the customers, if we just get 5% of the customers who we're going to leave to stay, that increases profits, not revenues, profits, mm. 25 to 100%. So when you go in to work with a company, because I mean, what you're saying is not it's not news in the sense. No, that, I mean, we, not at all. We have known this for, for quite some time, but yet exactly. we haven't changed how we do things. So when you go into an organization, what are the things that you look to change? Because one of the things I always feel is, is, is kind of lacking is that kind of single view of the customer experience, right? Which I yes. think is a, big, is a big kind of you know, default that organizations just structure themselves incorrectly in order to do that because they see them at you're just very, very much cut up into different sections. So what are the things that you look to do in a company in order to get them focused? Because the logic of the profitability is great. I'm not sure that'll appeal to the accountant. Um, but, <laughs> yes. but, but to actually how they, because this is actually about how they transact business. So how do you get them to change the way they do business? Well, I, the, the entire methodology behind my book is not just a practice and a, and a playbook, as you alluded to earlier, but it's a philosophy. It's a yeah. mindset. It's a way of being. And so one of the first things we do, and I require this of all of the consulting companies I work with, we begin with a presentation that I give to the entire company. Everyone, I don't care what role you play in the company from the top to the bottom, from the receptionist to the CEO in every which way, 
everyone in the same conversation. And the reason we do that is so we have a common nomenclature. We have a common terminology set by which as we refer to these things going forward, we know everyone's on the same page. The second thing we do is we put together a customer experience team. Now, the secret in putting together a customer experience team is to not only take the person in your organization who has the title customer experience manager, <laughs> if you have one of those, but to open it up to the entire company for volunteers to join the team. What we find and what I've found with thousands of companies around the world is there are people in your organization who inherently understand this. They understand how to create personal and emotional connections, but for some reason, they've been placed in a silo within your organization that does not allow them to flourish. And by opening the door after this group presentation and saying, who would like to come join us? We get people from every department coming forward. Now what we've done is we've seeded advocates in the various divisions of your organization who believe in this concept, who are committed to this concept, and are going to be our on-the-ground uh, supporters who will continue to promote that in a very siloed organization. The third thing we do, and then there's a lot more after that, but these are the top three, is to, as you said, John, create a map of the current customer journey that everyone understands. And I will tell you, the way I do this, we bring everybody in the room together, we pick one volunteer and we go through and we map the entire journey. And then we ask the other people to fill in the spots that they missed. And then we ask more people, fill in the spots that they missed. And what we realize is, I have yet to find an organization greater than one person so if it's a solo entrepreneur, they usually have it pretty dialed in. But the second we move to the number two person in the company, no one in the organization understands the complete customer journey from beginning to end. And just that revelation alone, that realization that there are so many pieces of the puzzle and there's so many interactions, when we track what the interactions are and what they do, that alone usually produces enough of an aha moment where the employees now realize the pain that they are putting the customers through. And, and have that's you seen, where we can make change. And have you seen the organizations change their structure in order to facilitate this to happen? Yes, absolutely. What I've found is that the, the organizations that embrace this the most realize that silos don't work. Mm. I'm a farm kid. I grew up in the Midwest of the United States in the state of Iowa. It's a big farming state. And if you go to any farm in the Midwest, there are these huge grain silos where they store all the grain. Silos are incredible on a farm. They are horrible in a business. Mm. And what happens is we get so siloed in our business that we lose track of the fact that there are other people in this organization who have the same goal of serving the customer, but are doing it in a completely different way that we have blinders on and we don't see how they're doing it. The smartest organizations I've seen are the ones who take those silos, they break them down, and instead they build entire teams that are designed to take different types of customers through the journey. So let's say you have three different products where you build a team that has sales, customer service, support, accounting, all in one thing dealing with one client, and they all have the same insight into the journey for that specific customer. Okay. You say that you've got a hundred days to get it right. Yes. Right? Uh, which is, you know, in, in, you know, you know, that's actually a relatively short period of time. It is. Because particularly if you're looking for the kind of the lifetime value of a client, which can be, you know, anywhere between, you know, five, seven, ten, you know, it can be anything beyond that. But it's certainly, it's, it's you know, 100 days is a short time. So maybe talk about some of the key things that you need to do and you talk about in the book in order to get it right. Sure. Well, the, the first thing I think that might be useful for your listeners is to know that uh, based on all the research, and we looked at companies, small, medium, and large, international and domestic, online and offline, product and service, you name it, somewhere between 40 and 80% of your new customers, it can go down as low as 20, but it's somewhere between 20 and 80% of your new customers will decide to stop doing business with you in the first 100 days. 
Before you reach the 100 day anniversary, they will leave. In banking, it's 32%. In the restaurant industry, it's between 50 and 80%. Software as a service is 20%. Cell phone industry, 21%. Mm. You know, all these industries, the numbers are staggering. And yet most businesses aren't paying attention to that. As you pointed out, John, I'm not asking you to sprint forever. I'm asking you to run hard for 100 days, to lay a foundation in that first 100 days of the customer relationship. Because the research also shows that if on day 101, your customer is feeling fantastic about your organization, they are feeling that you're remarkable, that you're taking care of them, they're feeling connected, the typical customer will stay for five years. So you talk about getting that lifetime value. If you lay the foundation in the first 100 days, it's incredible. So what do you do in those first 100 days? Well, I think you do a couple of things. Number one, you map that customer journey. Number two, you look at where are the handoffs happening that the baton may be getting dropped. I'll call out two areas that show up in almost every business. There is a drop between the day the customer signs up for your product or service, which I call the admit phase, day one of the first 100 days, and the activate phase, which is that first real moment of truth. In the activate phase, this is where they maybe get the product in the mail, they go through an unboxing experience, or you have the kickoff meeting, whatever you call it. The gap between their signing on the dotted line and their first moment of truth where they start to see value In common parlance, we refer to this as buyer's remorse, Mm. the time period where they begin to doubt the decision they just made. In my eight-phase journey, I call it the affirm stage. And in this stage, you want to reaffirm their choice. So that's the number one place where most businesses fall apart. I'd ask all of your listeners, how many of you have ever heard of buyer's remorse? Almost everyone listening would raise their hand, right? I'd say, great. But but isn't it interesting, though, because if you you talk about that, I mean, for example, if I go on to go back to one of your examples, if I go, say, to Amazon or go to Zappos and I buy something, I I get it. And I so I now I've now now got the product. But if I go to to take your other example, if I go to a bank. Right. And I'm there because it's I'm looking at this as a long term relationship. I'm not getting the result of the relationship with the bank in the 100 days, whereas I will have got my pair of shoes or whatever it is that I bought. So how do you actually, yeah, because you haven't had the time for the bank. Right. Right. I, I don't know why I pick a bank because that's probably actually a bad example. <laughs> no, but, but no, but that I mean, it's a, it's a it's a just it's a great example in the sense that there's some businesses that deliver what you're trying to accomplish faster than others. Yeah. Right. And you either fall everybody listening. Your business is either one who delivers the results quickly or a business that it takes longer time. You mentioned earlier the ad agency or the PR company that yeah. would come in. They're not delivering results tomorrow. They're no. going to deliver results over time. Two thoughts on that. Number one, let's take the Amazon example. There's two pieces of the puzzle there. The affirm buyer's remorse stage that I was referring to is the time period that happens between when you press order on your Amazon cart and when you actually receive the product. Now, what's interesting is Amazon will send you emails. They will send you text messages. Hey, your product is shipped. Hey, it's out for delivery. Hey, it just arrived at your front door. They're doing all these things to remind you that even though you haven't gotten the gratification of receipt, work is still being done to advance your goal of getting the item. So then once you have the item, well, they're like, hey, we've done our part because Amazon is really the store and delivery service. They are not the ones who actually are responsible for creating the product that you purchased. Mm -hmm. What happens in that Amazon setting is the people who sold you the product usually never check in with you. They never reach out to say, hey, John, did you like the shoes? Did you wear the shoes? Did they fit? Did they work well? And so there's a big opportunity there. In a banking scenario, not only do we have that kind of a firm stage that I talked to, but what you're actually alluding to is what I refer to as the accomplish phase. This is phase six of the eight phases of the customer journey, where you actually accomplish the goal you had when you originally made the purchase. Now, in a banking scenario, if my goal is to get a checking account, well, I can walk out of the bank 
with a checking account and a couple of blank checks. Now, the actual ones with my name and number are going to be mailed to me two or three weeks later, and that's really when I feel like I have it. But then I need to write the check, have the check cashed and come back through before I have the full experience. Mm -hmm. That's great for a checking account. But what if you've gone to the bank for a mortgage? When does that goal end? Well, depending on what your country you're in, maybe 15 years from now, maybe 30 okay. years from now, yeah. it's a really long out accomplish phase. And what do most banks do during that period? Nothing Just other than your accept money. your money. Exactly. <laughs> when there's a huge opportunity, if they're taking your money every month, why not continue to deepen the relationship? You know, something that I've always found interesting here in the United States, and I know you've got an international uh, audience, so uh, forgive me for using the American example, but I'm going to make fun of Americans, so it's totally <laughs> okay, all right? So what I find fascinating here in the United States is you get, say, for example, a 30-year mortgage, and you're making payments on that every month, and the interest rates change, and they go down and then you refinance your mortgage. I have never heard of a bank reaching out to the customer saying, hey, the interest rates have dropped 2%. Here's the paperwork to refinance your mortgage at this yeah. better rate. Just press here and you'll, your electronic signature will go through and your payments will go down every month. If a bank actually did that, not only do I think those customers would become loyal customers for life, but don't you think they'd go on social media and tell everybody Absolutely. they knew? Yeah. Don't you think the next time they were having a dinner party, they'd tell all their friends? Mm -hmm. Folks, when you do the right thing for, everybody wants their customers to talk about them on social. Uh, companies figure out these, concoct these insane competitions and challenges and all these things that are designed to get your customer to post on their Facebook wall or to tweet that they like you. That's one way to go about it. But I'd rather go about it by saying, what could you do that would be so remarkable that they can't help but talk about mm. you and to have it be unexpected? Now, I get it. The bank would, quote unquote, lose money by reducing the fee, yeah. by reducing the interest. But what they lost in dollars, I truly believe they would make up in loyalty and promotion and word of mouth marketing. And they would get it back in dollars. There's no doubt oh, about it. They absolutely. would get it back, they would get back get it in back. dollars. I mean, at the end of the day, they'll still get their principal back. They might get a smaller percentage rate, but let's be candid. They're already making a ton of money off yeah. of that initial loan. And you would, buy, you would buy other products from them. Exactly. One of the things you talk about, the, the eight phases of the customer experience, and, and, and they you know, fortunately all start with A, which- They do. <laughs> from, assess, from assess to advocate. And, but one of the great things I found in the book was that you do have these at the end of each section, you do have these kind of checklists and asking, what are you doing about this? What are you doing about that? And here are some ideas, which, which is great. And I, and I really would advocate for anybody uh, doing that. But I'm just conscious of, of your time, but you talk about the six tools that, that yes. we all have at our disposal. And you believe that most of us are really only using maybe two? Correct. Maybe two, maybe three, right? And so if I may, the six tools as I see it that you can use to communicate with your customers in the first 100 days and beyond our in-person interactions, which I know can be a little messy in our COVID-19 pandemic world, but nonetheless, they're still there. In-person interactions, emails, which is the number one tool most organizations use. And yet I would ask all of your listeners, how many of you are sitting at home saying, boy, I wish I was getting more email? Yeah, that'd be almost yeah. none of you, exactly. right? Some of the salespeople go, I was wishing I was getting more email leads. Okay, yeah. fine. But other than that, do you want more email? No. And yet that's the number one tool most organizations use to communicate with your customers. Number three, we have mail, physical mail, the snail mail, the post, which most businesses quit using and started using email. And now the only thing we send in the mail is a general rule, our invoices. 
And then we've got phone calls. And I get that a lot of you don't like talking on the phone, but many of your customers still enjoy that medium of communication. We then got videos. Number five is videos. So using videos not only as a marketing tool, which a lot of businesses are starting to use it as a marketing tool, but as a communication tool with your existing customers. And last but not least, gifts and presents. Strategic moments of delight strategic appreciation of your customers. Now, pro tip, if the item you're giving has a logo on it, that is not a present for your customer. That is a present for you. That is a marketing tool. I'm not opposed to promotional products and tchotchkes and giveaways, but stop deluding yourself to think that that's a present for your customer. It's Mm -hmm. not. In the same way that giving your customer a coupon for a discount off a future purchase, that is not a gift for them. That is a gift Mm -hmm. for you. A gift is something that we give that allows the recipient to say, this person knows me better than I thought. Mm -hmm. This person, this organization cares about me more than I thought. They've been listening. They've been paying attention. And isn't it interesting, Joey, that that it doesn't have to be expensive? No, not at all. It can be very inexpensive. It can, because somebody actually sent me something recently that was almost, it was almost homemade, but they put a lot of thought into it and it was quite funny. And of course it came in snail mail, which as exactly. you said, you don't yet get an awful so lot So now off. you get two checks. They used the mail yeah. and it was a present. No, yeah. John, I totally agree with you. Uh, do a quick experiment here for everybody listening at home. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand, even though I can't see you, just play along if you would. How many of you have a thank you note that someone wrote to you that you've received within the last year? How many of you have received a thank you note within the last year? Raise your hand. Mm. Okay, so that people raise their hand. Now keep your hand up if you still have that thank you note. Now what's interesting, John, is statistically, you do, you still have it. So let's use you. So here's the thing, let's play along, John. You've already read the thank you note. You remember who it was from. Why did you keep it instead of recycling it? because it was just noteworthy and I appreciate it. Exactly. In 2020, in this modern era, humans are dying for proof that they matter. Mm. They are dying for a physical, tangible artifact that they have contributed to the world and someone noticed. If you want to send a present to your customers that they will keep, that will cost you less than $2 all in, hand write them a thank you note where you sincerely tell them how much you appreciate your, their business and be specific. Why is it that you appreciate your, their business? Why do you enjoy working with them? Why do you enjoy serving them? Send them that note. I promise you the likelihood of them reading that note and keeping that note and seeing that note as a physical talisman or artifact of your relationship is much greater than if you send them a pen with your logo on it. And that also does come back, because you, you do talk about in the book, is the information that you gather about your customers and having a good system for holding that. I mean, you know, a, a good CRM, but a CRM that you use. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. People ask me all the time. I, I field probably three emails a day, John, from yeah. someone saying, what is the best CRM system to yeah, use? Yeah, yeah. And my the- answer is always the same the one you'll actually use. Yeah, I don't exactly. care if it's a three ring binded notebook that you're writing down information about your customer by hand. I want somewhere where you're tracking the things about your customer so that later when you communicate with them, you can refer back to those. Yeah. Because if there's one thing I know, it's that ink fades slower than memory. Mm-hmm. If you write it down, you have a much higher likelihood of remembering it in the future. And you know what fades even slower than ink? The ones and zeros that get typed into your computer CRM, right? So track that information. And if you're going to ask your customers for information, if you're going to ask them what their birthday is, you darn well better send them birthday wishes on their Mm -hmm. birthday. If you're going to ask them what their favorite book is, what their favorite movie is, what their favorite hobby is, use that information, feed that information back to them in another way at a later date. 
Great, great, great idea. Joey, this has been fantastic. I've taken up more of your time than I said I would, and you've been very oh, John, gracious. Oh, John, it's all good. It's all good. I love, I love the conversation. So two questions I ask everybody. Yes. A book other than your own that has had made an impact upon you, what it is and why it's made it such an impact. Oh, John, there's so many. There's so many. I, I take great pride in being a voracious reader. Uh, we, we stopped counting at 5,000 books in the house uh, that we have, so I'm a big fan of books. Um, the one that comes to mind, uh, there, and that because there are so many, but one that is very top of mind for me right now is one that I'm about four chapters in. And one of the ways I evaluate whether a book is a good book or not is how much I'm highlighting mm. and how much I'm making notes in the marginalia and saying, oh, this is something I want to refer back to. And this book, it looks as if my highlighter and my pen exploded inside the book because I'm just tracking so many things. This is a newer book called The Art of Making Memories, How to Create and Remember Happy Moments. And it's by a Scandinavian author, and I'm going to butcher his name. So, <laughs> sir, please forgive me. And any of our Scandinavian listener friends, if you want to let me know how to properly pronounce this, my good friend Ryan Holiday, who's also a great writer, says, never make fun of someone for mispronouncing a word because it probably means that they read it before they heard it used in a sentence. Right. And this gentleman's name falls in that category. His name, I think, is Meek Wiking. So M E I K, last name W I K I N G, like Viking with a W, Viking, right? And it's all about why is it that we remember certain moments in our lives? Like, what is the science behind oh, okay. memory? And what can we do to affirmatively start to create memories? The reason I find this particularly interesting is because as a guy who works predominantly in customer experience and employee experience, I want customers and employees to have happy memories and happy moments. So I'm reading into the science of why people remember these uh, certain moments and figuring out ways that we can extrapolate from the science of how the brain works to plug those into business operations. Wow, well, I love, I love getting a book that I haven't heard of and I haven't heard of that one. So that will definitely go on, go on the list. Second question is daily rituals. If you have them, what are they and what do they do for you? Yes, yeah, so I, I must confess I have very few daily rituals. I, I should probably have more than I have, but one that I have that I have been uh, absolutely committed to for seven years now, and I can actually show you because I have an example here. It's called the five-minute journal. All right, yes, yes. Now let me yeah. pull this out. Wow. These are six month journals. Each of these represents six months. So here is a full six years through volume 12. I'm working on volume 13 right now. It sits next to my bed. And the five minute journal is a fantastic tool that was created by my friends, Alex Icon and UJ Ramdas. And what it is, is you spend about three minutes writing it in the morning and two minutes writing in the evening. So right when I wake up, I write in it. And right before I go to bed, I write in it. a total of five minutes. And what it does is it asks you, what are some things that you are thankful for? What are some things that you would have to happen today to make for an amazing day? And what's your intention for the day? Those are the morning questions. In the evening, it asks you, what happened today that was amazing? And what happened today that uh, you would like to improve on going forward? Or how could it, you have made today better? It's not, I don't take it as the what went wrong today as much as the what can I focus on. Mm. I will tell you, John, I have been writing in this religiously. I haven't missed a day uh, oh. since I started writing seven years ago. And what it has done by having a daily practice of gratitude it has made me very, very cognizant of just how fortunate and lucky I am, yeah. just how often things go my way. Because as an entrepreneur, and I know a lot of your listeners are entrepreneurs, one of the challenges of being an entrepreneur and being in business in any capacity, even in a corporate setting, is that there are good days and there are bad days. Yeah, absolutely. Writing in the five-minute journal has allowed me to realize that even the bad days are part of a bigger picture of good days. And I so I highly recommend the five minute journal. You can find it on Amazon. Yeah, yeah, you can yeah. go to five minute journal.com. Great guys, great journal and a, a great daily practice. 
That is fantastic. Joey, thank you so much. It has been an absolute pleasure. You've been so giving of your time. Again, I highly recommend everyone to go and get the book. It will do so much for your business. Where can people get in touch with you? The best place to find me online is at my website, joeycoleman.com. That's J-O-E-Y, like a five-year-old child you know or a baby kangaroo, Joey uh, (laughs) Coleman, C-O-L-E-M-A-N, like the camping equipment company, but no relation, joeycoleman.com. There you'll find videos, you'll find more information about the book. And I encourage folks, if you are interested in this idea of customer experience and how to enhance it, please come give a visit, reach out and connect on LinkedIn in, drop a line, because I am on a mission to raise the bar. I believe the bar for customer experience globally is lying on the ground. Uh, Really, all we need to do is lift a foot up to step over it instead of keeping tripping over it. So I would love to help any organizations that want to take their customer experience to the next level. Well, I certainly would endorse what you're saying, and I certainly would recommend anyone to go and get the book because it is a great read and it is really practical. Joey, thank you so much indeed for being with us. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. And thanks to everybody for listening in. We really appreciate your time.